Happy Sunday again. Welcome to Pathfinder and to our series, The Good Book. We're helping you unlock the goodness of Scripture. Um, I want to say something uh, off the front that might be a little shocking to some of you, so buckle up. When it comes to the Bible, here's what I want you to know. The Bible wasn't originally written in English. Maybe that sounds obvious, but as a kid growing up in the church, no one ever told me that. In fact, I I went to church and I would hear people speaking this language that no one else in my life ever spoke, using words like thou and thine and thy and thus saith the Lord. And no one in my life talked that way. And so I just kind of assumed that's how God spoke. That was, you know, divine language. I, I didn't know that that, that the Bible was actually written in a different language. I thought that was actually God's native, native tongue. And I, I didn't understand why it sounded so funny. I just assumed that it was the case. All I knew was that because I went to church, when we studied Shakespeare in English class, I was good at it. Like, I understood it. All the other kids were like, I don't know what this means. I'm like, I know what this means. This is God speaking, right? This is how God talks to us. And uh, in fact, uh, if you know the history of that, that version of the Bible, the King James Bible, a version that a lot of us grew up with, um, you might know that it was commissioned by King James I of, of England, and it was published in 1611. Well, guess when Shakespeare was retiring, you know, moving to Boca, wrapping up his career? He didn't move to Boca, just, that, that's a joke. Um, but he, he was wrapping up his, his literary career, 1612, right? 1611, 1612. These guys were, you know, doing their work at the same time, which is why they sound the same. So this, this voice that I've heard in my head as a kid of, oh, that must be what God sounds like with all the thou, thine, uh, thy, thus saith stuff, that, that was actually more of, you know, this 1600s British dialect Um, And although 1611 was a long time ago, (laughs) Jesus was a long time before that, right? Which just, again, proves the point that the Bible wasn't originally written in English. So what we have today as we think about the Bible, and and that's what this series is all about, and again, it's going to feel a little more like a seminar maybe than a typical message, Um, but, but what we have in our modern versions of the Bible then are translations from original languages, And I say translations because especially those of us who are English speakers, we have a lot of translations. Um, If you were to walk into a bookstore, remember those? Used to have those. Bookstores, you know, stores filled with books, right? Um, If you walk into a bookstore and, and you go to the Bible section, you would see a whole wall of Bibles and you would see all different kinds. You'd see paperbacks and hardcovers and leatherback ones and you'd see study Bibles and devotional Bibles and kids' Bibles and... And then you would also see these letter codes on the Bible. Some would say NIV, some would say KJV, some would say NASB or NIRV. And, and, and what those letter codes are, are that they're telling us what translation of the Bible uh, you can find in those, in those pages. You'd find all different kinds of translations, all different kinds of versions, which makes us ask the question then, which is the best one? If you're standing in front of that bookshelf and and there are all these different Bibles, which one, which translation is the most faithful? Which one is the best version of the Bible? And it is a great question. Again, especially for English speakers who have so many different options. Because if you read different versions, different translations of the same Bible, depending if it's NIV or NASB or KJV, you'll notice that they sound different. They say slightly different things. Uh, To show you a a pretty easy example, I think, I want to use a well-known scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. It goes like this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, this is from the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible. That's the Bible version that we tend to read most out of here at Pathfinder. Uh, And chances are maybe you've heard this sometime in your life, especially if you've ever been to a confirmation service. This is a favorite for confirmation verses, and it's a great verse, you see why. Um, Jeremiah 29, 11. Now, I I wanna show you what this looks like in some other translations or versions. Here's the English Standard Version, ESV. For I know the plans I have for you, sounds the same, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. 
Or here's uh, the NASB. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosperity and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Um, Here is the message translation. Um, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you and not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. Or God's word translation. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. There are plans for peace and not disaster. Plans to give you a future filled with hope. Or you can look at the King James Version, the one I told you about a minute ago. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now, in all of those different translations, you get the idea that God is saying something good, right? And none of those do you come away going like, oh, sounds like God is out to hurt us. You get the point that God is doing something good, not doing bad things. But if you look kind of at, at, at maybe a list of some of those key words that we looked at, depending on the translation, you have things like, okay, God has plans for peace or welfare or prosperity or he has a plan to take care of us. And while these are all good words, these words are kind of different, aren't they? If you don't believe me that they're kind of different or that they don't matter, just imagine these different words coming out of the mouth of a politician. Pretty soon you'd be able to detect what kind of rally you were at, depending on the words they use, right? If if they're saying peace versus welfare, or prosperity versus taking care, like you'd be like, oh, I I know what this is. Those, Those words are different. Or if you look at the negative side here, the stuff that God says he's not out to do, he's not out to harm us, okay? He's not out not out to do evil. I hope not. He's God. Not to bring disaster, not out to abandon us. Again, Uh, It's good that God is not doing any of these things, but which one is right? Uh, And here's what I want you to know, especially when we look back at this this positive side here, peace, welfare, prosperity, taking care. The reason that these translations reflect different English words is not because one is better than the other. It's not because one is trying to be faithful and the others are not trying to be faithful. They're all faithful translations. The reason that these words are different is because the meaning of the Hebrew word that is being translated there, right, translated into all of these different options, the Hebrew word is just too big for any single English word. See, the the Hebrew word translated in Jeremiah 29, 11, I have plans to, you know, prosper you or bring peace. The, The word is this Hebrew word. It's my favorite Hebrew word. The word is shalom. Maybe you've heard it before, shalom. Still a greeting used by Jewish peoples. Shalom, uh, my other favorite Hebrew word in case you're keeping track, is chesed. Shalom and chesed. You know, drop those on your neighbors this Memorial Day, right? Um, chesed is covenant love or faithfulness. It's kind of like the equivalent of grace. But, but shalom is this Hebrew word that is, is sometimes translated peace, often translated peace. Uh, But shalom, in in my version of the Bible, if I were going to translate the Bible, which I never will do, I'm not that much of a scholar, but in my version of the Bible, Jeremiah 29, 11 would say, I have plans for complete wellness for you. Or I have plans for wholeness. See, that's what shalom is, wholeness. That's why here at Pathfinder, we talk about how we're bringing together imperfect people in pursuit of a whole life. We're talking about shalom, And you see, it's not that one translation is right and the other one is wrong. It's just that this word shalom is too big for any single word. And so the translators wrestle with what's the most faithful way. How how do you take this word that's too big and how do you boil it down to an English word? Now, now that's a pretty benign example, right? Again, you don't get the meaning wrong. You, You get the general idea of what God is out to do. But here's another question for us. In light of all of those options, and believe me, there are so many more in English... How do you resist the temptation to shop for a translation that says whatever it is, that says things the way that you already want it to say it, right? I mean, if there's a translation that kind of says it every different way, how do you resist the temptation not just to go searching for a translation that will say it the way you want it to be said, that will fit your preconceived notions? I mean, how do you let the Word of God stand on its own How do you conform your life to the word of God when you have all of these options where you basically get to say, well, am I a prosperity person or a welfare person? Which one am I? And you get to pick. Or on the other side, 
If you can just shop for your favorite translation and they're all the kind of same, then doesn't that mean that they're all a little bit unreliable at least? Now, before you go too far with that, uh, here's what I want to remind you of. that uh, I said that the English versions of the Bible that we have today are all translations from original languages. The good news is we still have Bibles in their original languages. These are my personal Bibles. Uh, this is the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. If you're reading it this way, though, you're reading it the wrong way because it is the Hebrew Bible, and Hebrew Bibles, uh, you read backwards from our way. You read them this way. Um, so this is how you know that you don't know what you're doing with the Hebrew Bible if you try to open it this way. Uh, you read it this way. And so um, this is a Hebrew Bible. It's you know Hebrew text. You can kind of see that. Um, and in seminary, I had to learn enough Hebrew to be able to translate parts of the Bible. We still have the Bible recorded in its original text. This is the uh, Nestle Alon 27th Greek, uh, Greek New Testament. And uh, this opens the way that we're accustomed to. Um, and this is the New Testament Bible written in Greek. Uh, most of the Bible's written in Hebrew, Greek. There's a little bit of Aramaic um, just in sections. But we still have the Bible in original languages. It's not like we're left only with these, these translations. And not only do we have you know, these Bibles, as you can tell, they're kind of old, but they're not that old. These are not original from the time of Jesus or before. What we do have, though, is we have in museums and academic institutions, we have manuscripts, we have scrolls, we have parchments, we have codices, these really old books that have been preserved. And then we have a whole discipline. And, and again, this is kind of seminar stuff, but I think it's important for you to know. We have a whole discipline in academia and in science called text criticism, where these academ academics and scientists get together and, and they piece together these old manuscript traditions and they somehow, through all of that, compile what we have this, uh, in this, a faithful rendering of the original Greek or Hebrew text. And, and what they do as they go through this, I've got an image for you, is in the Hebrew, this is Hebrew here, at the bottom they put a text critical apparatus where they log, now this is incredible, they log every variation that they find in those ancient manuscripts. So you know that they didn't have copy machines for quite a while before everything was hand copied. And every once in a while, Apparently someone would copy something wrong and so there'd be a misspelling. Well, these scientists who do this work, if there is a misspelling, they note it in the footnotes and they note which manuscript traditions, which scrolls, which codices, which parchments have the, the variation. If there's a word missing, they note that in some manuscripts the word is missing so that everything, nothing swept under the rug, everything is recorded, every, you know, like good math students, they always show their work they're disclosing everything. And so then when you get to the text, you can actually read and see, hey, what might be different in different math, uh, in different, uh, this is the Gospel of Matthew, in different uh, manuscript traditions, what might be missing? Oh, and, and this one, you know, it's missing the word Matthew, and, and the other one, it, it says it. They're showing all of the work. See, I think sometimes we assume that, um, that the way we got our English Bibles is kind of like a game of telephone. You ever play that? That's kind of what we assume, right? Like you're passing this along and it went from one language to another language to another language to another language and, and eventually it gets to us and so by the end, you know, peas sounds like fleas and, and you're so far away from what God originally said in the scriptures. What I want you to understand today is that this is not the model of biblical translation that has given us our modern translations. The truth is we still have these very scholarly texts where even all the variations are recorded and, and they're pretty minor, the smallest things, the misspellings, they're all recorded. And then, and then scholars go from these texts to create a, uh, a modern English translation. Which brings us back to the end of the question, okay? The question, the question, the question. So we've got these scholarly uniform texts, you know, one, one for each, Hebrew, Greek. How do you get from these scholarly texts of the Bible how do you get the full list of versions that we have in our Bible app today? Right? How do you go from this, a singular text, to all the different versions, all the different translations that we have today? And the answer to that question is an important answer. The answer is translational agenda. Every translation has an agenda. Now, I know that we get nervous when we hear the word agenda. 
Because agenda means, usually means for us that someone is up to no good. But that's not what agenda means. A hidden agenda, that could be dangerous. Every, every work has an agenda, right? A philosophy. And so before translators sit down and they decide to make a, a new version of the English Bible, they start off clarifying what their agenda or their philosophy is before they translate a word. Because that will shape how the translation ends up looking like. One of the agenda items that translators wrestle with is a simple question of readability. They'll start off saying, how readable do we want this Bible to be? Should it be a Bible that third graders could read? Like the new international readers version? That's what they set out to do. We want to create a highly readable version of the Bible that you can read without having a very high reading level. Or do we want a version of the Bible that will require a very high level of read of, uh, of, uh, of linguistic you know, prowess? Um, you get to the RSV or the KJV. These, these are kind of higher versions. So, so down here you've got, you know, can third graders read it? Or way up here, these are the Bibles that only Doug Moss can read and understand. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? That guy's got a vocabulary, doesn't he? Um, Right, and so, so you start off with that question at first, and, and obviously, if, if you're here, you've got way more options for words, and, and try, try, try to get the exact right word than you do down here. I mean, here you just gotta go with words that people are gonna know. You've got much more nuance here. And so translational committees, they'll start off with these questions of how readable do we want the Bible to be? Not only that, but then they'll, uh, they'll go further, and uh, they deal with, with this. The translations that we have in English, and I mean, these are many of them, not all of them, you can see it up there, maybe better. It's, it's small because there are a lot of them. Um, they start off with a philosophy or an agenda. Do we want this to be a word-for-word -word translation where every word is translated directly into a corresponding word? Or do we want it more thought-for-thought? Thought? Do we want to look at whole phrases and say, what is the gist that the, trans or that the original uh, you know, writer was, was trying to get at? And then we'll translate that as a whole unit, not word-for-word. Word. And then we have paraphrases, which really go a step further, and they say, hey, you know, let's bring in all of the culture stuff, all of the things that you might not know about, and let's try to add those things into the translation so that people get a sense of cultural reading. So on one hand, word for word, you have like the NASB. When I was in the seminary and I discovered the NASB, I was so excited because it's a literal word for word translation. And so um, if you wanted to check your translational work when you were translating from Greek and Hebrew, the NASB was a great friend. Because you kind of be like, oh, I, I got it right, word for word. I mean, just pretty literal translation. Um, way over here on the paraphrase side you, ha side, you have something like the Living Bible or the Message Version. I, I read a, a part of the Message Version for you, for you earlier. See, uh, each translational committee starts with this question of how do we want to be? Now, now, even I know for some of us, we automatically have a bias here. And we're like, oh, word for word, that must be the more faithful translation. I don't want people to paraphrase stuff for me because that, that's, that's probably getting some stuff lost in translation. Word for word must be the most faithful version of the Bible. These are the correct ones. These ones are not so correct. Um, the other day, my daughter was at a student ministry event in high school, and, uh, and there's the God's Word version uh, translation of the Bible. It's kind of here more in a paraphrase version. And she was like, Dad, or it was actually the message. She was like, Dad, is the message bad? And I'm like, what do you mean is the message bad? Is it, is it bad? People here are saying it's bad. And I'm like, no, it's not bad. It's, it's just, it's a paraphrase. It actually can be, can be really, really helpful. Uh, now, before you make judgment on this, I, uh, Heath Lumen, one of our teachers here at St. John's School, showed me this this week, and I thought, you know, that, that's, really, that's really right on. Uh, there's a Spanish phrase, que pasa calabaza. Que pasa calabaza. I don't speak a lot of Spanish, I speak a little. But if you ask me to translate this, I could do it for you really in one of three ways. More than that, but I'll do it in one or three. Uh, one of three. Que pasa calabaza. Uh, if I do a literal word-for-word -word translation like the NASB, I'm going to translate this for you something like, what's moving pumpkin? So if someone comes up to you and say, hey, que pasa, que pasa calabaza, and, and, and you look at me and you go, what, Dion, what did he say? And I say, oh, he said, what's moving pumpkin? You're going to be confused, right? To understand that, you're going to have to understand idiom. You're going to have to understand what pumpkins mean to Latin peoples. Like, you're going to have to understand all kinds of stuff. Uh, that, that's kind of one way of translating. Uh, if I want to just help you understand, like, the gist culturally of what this means, uh, que pasa calabasa just kind of means, like, what, what's happening, man? 
And that's what I'll tell you. Oh, he just, he said, what's happening, man? What's going on? Uh, that's kind of like what the NIV does. That's why we like the NIV here. It's just kind of a, gives you a sense of meaning, but it, um, it tries to translate it into, into what's true today. Um, if, if I take this a step further, because you, you know, when you say this phrase, even if you don't understand it, que pasa calabasa, it's got kind of this nice rhythm to it, a little bit of a rhyme to it. And if I say, you know what, I really, it's not just about, hey, what's happening? I want to preserve some of the poetry of this. Then I might make a decision to translate this for you. What's up, buttercup? Right? It's got that same feel. Que pasa, calabaza. What's up, buttercup? Now, if you walk away from that, assuming that buttercups and pumpkins are similar, you're going to be confused, right? Because that's not the point. The point wasn't to tell you what pumpkin means. The point was to help translate for you what this phrase means. See, that's what these translations are, are setting out to do. They start with a different agenda, a different concern that, that you know, depending on the concern, depending on the agenda, will make the translation look different. So, so again, the question for us today, which one is best? Which one is the right one? Which one is the most faithful one? And the answer is, it depends. Right? It depends. What are you reading the Bible for? Do you want to have to do all the work to understand what pumpkins mean to Latin peoples? Or, or do you want someone just to just kind of cut to the chase and tell you what it means in your own time, in your own culture? And see, I think herein lies something really important on this whole issue of translations and even what versions of the Bible that we decide to read. Uh, and I'm really grateful for how last week Doug Moss, if you don't know Doug, he's our associate pastor, um, how he helped us understand the difference between, he talked about reading scripture and studying scripture, and even pointed to some terms that I like to use in my own life. I, I think about a personal or devotional use of scripture, and then I think about a scholarly, academic, or teaching use of scripture. And in my life, I, I kind of have a relationship with scripture in both ways. I have a personal devotional use of scripture, and then I have an academic studying, teaching use of scripture. Uh, and when Doug talked last week about, you know, reading scripture versus studying scripture, I've been wrestling with that this week, and I think, you know what, in my devotional life, I think I still primarily read the scriptures, and I think that's okay. Uh, for personal use, I'm reading the scriptures. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, but when it comes to messages, when it comes to preaching, when it comes to helping others discern the will of God or the word of God in a changing cultural context, I've definitely learned that you can't just read the scriptures, you have to study the scriptures. And, and I think so much of our confusion about the Bible, our confusion about translations and everything else comes because we've mixed up these two very different uses of scripture, these different approaches to scripture. And let me just be clear about something. Only some of us are called to teach the scriptures, right? If you're not sure about it, I'll, go, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute. Only some of us are called to teach the scriptures. On the other hand, all of us are called into a relationship, a personal relationship with the scriptures. See, we say even, um, this is kind of a long-held truth about, about the Bible, that we believe the scriptures are clear. And what we mean by that when we say that is we, meet, we believe that the message, the core message of scripture is clear. It's accessible to everyone. And what we're talking about is the message that God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We're talking about the core message of God's, God's gift of salvation through Jesus, the relationship he calls us back to himself through Jesus. And we say that's the ultimate message of scripture. Jesus declared it about himself after the resurrection, said these scriptures, they've all been testifying about me. And, and that's accessible to everyone. When we say the message of scripture is clear and it's accessible to everyone, that's what we mean. What we do not mean, and we shouldn't pretend for a minute that what we mean, is that that means that somehow all of the big questions of life and theology and what the scriptures mean, that that's going to be equally clear to every Christian who owns a Bible. It's not. And that's why some guys like me go to seminary for a long time and we learn dead languages and learn how to translate them. We, we learn the tools. It, it's why you have me here in a paid position to do this because we recognize that, that this isn't for somebody, this is, or for everybody, this is only for certain People and, and I think I think where we get wrong, even in our, our uh, understanding of the scripture and translations and, and what a Christian's relationship with the scripture is supposed to be like, 
I believe where we've gone wrong is, is that we've begun to tell Christians that they all need to be scholars. That in order to be a, a faithful Christian, you have to learn how to read the scriptures all by yourself, for yourself, on your own, in very in-depth ways. And, and I frankly find problems with that. Not, not just problems, I find three problems with that. I think there are three problems with this idea of universal Bible scholarship. The first one Doug Moss talked about last week, we have to reckon with the fact that for the fifth, first 1,500 years of Christianity, being a Bible scholar wasn't accessible for most people. Right? You didn't have Bibles. They weren't around. Most people weren't literate. And most people didn't have the luxury of time. You're just trying to survive. You're trying to feed your kids. You're trying to stay alive. You didn't have time to read reading and studying. That's kind of a luxury for some of us. And, and it's a luxury that we know in our, our part of the world, but still, still to this day, it's not just an ancient thing. Most of our world still is not literate. They don't have excess amounts of time. And there are still missionary agencies who are working right now to translate the Bible into every language. Every language on the planet does not have the Bible in its own tongue. And so if we say that, that in order to be a faithful Christian, you've got to study the scriptures in depth like a scholar, then we're dismissing the experience of, of pretty much every Christian who has ever lived and even now is living. We are the exception here. And I know that sounds controversial, but it's just true, isn't it? Not everybody has the access to the things that we have access to. And further, I'll tell you that I don't think every Christian needs to be a Bible scholar because some of the most inspiring Christians I have ever known in my life, some of the people who just inspired my love and my faithfulness were people who were barely literate. I'll talk more about that about that later. Um, see, the first problem is studying the scriptures isn't an option for most Christians. Uh, here's the second problem, that too many of us get caught preaching without a license. Uh, I mean that lightheartedly, but here's what happens. If, if you take in all of this scholarliness like we're prone to do, pretty soon you're going to be looking for an outlet for all of that scholarship. I mean, if you learn a bunch of stuff about the Bible, man, it's only a matter of time before you look for an outlet to share that with other people. And pretty soon you're going to go out thinking that it's your job to go out and correct error wherever you find it, to refute heresy, to set people straight in their theological misunderstandings. And you will assume that it is your job to do that without a call, without being examined by anybody, without any accountability or oversight. All the things that guys like me have. Right? I didn't just go to seminary and learn some stuff, but I was examined, someone certified that I knew my theology. Still to this day, I'm under the oversight of a board of elders, a whole denomination who hold me accountable to my teaching. I don't get to say whatever I want. I'm held in a position of accountability. So, so what I say is not just my own election, but, but, uh, but there's, there's accountability for that, right? That's kind of part of the whole thing. And yet so many of us, because we're filled with all the scholarly knowledge, we're dying to share it with someone and so we run off and we start preaching without a license. It's kind of like what WebMD did for, for medicine. People study a lot of years to become doctors, but I know that now because of WebMD, in about five minutes, I know just as much as my doctor does. Right, and I'm, I'm grateful for WebMD. It, I've learned a lot about my own health and taking responsibility for my own health because of WebMD. It's helped me a lot, but at the same time, if you ever see me scrubbing up to walk into an operating room, with a scalpel in hand, just because I studied up on WebMD, please tackle me. I'm going to hurt somebody, right? I, I shouldn't be there. That's, that's not the place for me. And yet, and yet I, I think we consistently misinterpret the scriptures on the subject. Uh, Paul says this in the scriptures. He, he says this, and I've heard a lot of us uh, kind of, I think a lot of us know this verse maybe. He says, all scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired. And it is useful for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So all scriptures, God breathed, and, and you get this idea that, hey, this, here's what the scriptures are for, to correct, to teach, to rebuke, to train in righteousness so that you might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's what the scriptures are for. Sounds good. But then you gotta look at who Paul was actually speaking to. He's speaking to this guy right here, Timothy. 
Paul wasn't speaking to a congregation of Christians. He was speaking to a pastor. Someone who had a call, someone who was examined, someone who had oversight, accountability, authority over him. And he says to him, hey, hey, as a pastor, this is your relationship with the scriptures. You're going to use that to teach, to correct, to rebuke, to train in righteousness. It'll help equip you for all of your work of service. Paul wasn't speaking to the church at large. See, not all of us are called to teach. Very few of us are. And so what that does is that will change the nature of the relationship we are intended to have with the scriptures. I'll show you what I mean in just a minute. Um, The third problem uh, that I want to go to first, though, um, is neglecting other things that are more important. When we make Bible scholarship the number one thing that Christians need to do, and we think this is for everybody, what happens is we end up neglecting other things that are more important. And again, in our, our modern American context, I think we can say, like, what is more important than studying the scriptures? Well, I'll let you see what Paul says about that. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, now you are the body, speaking to the church now, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, in the body, first of all, apostles, some people have this function, second prophets, third teachers, here's where teachers come in, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do you all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? The implied answer is <laughs> no, right? The implied answer is no, no. And then he says, now eagerly, eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. See, Paul's saying something really, really important, that within the body, we all have a different, we have a different function. That in the body of Christ, God calls us to specialization, to diversity, to differentiation, to a balance of gifts. Flat out, Paul is saying that not everyone should aspire to be a scholar, to be a teacher. And yet what so ha- often happens is, is in the body of Christ, whatever thing I am, whatever part I play, I automatically assume that everyone else should be that part, Right? Happens all the time in the body. So if I'm a prayer warrior and I pray a lot, I just assume that everyone in the body should pray as much as I do. And if I'm a servant and I love to serve people, I assume that everybody should spend as much time serving as I do. If I'm a singer, if I'm a worship leader, I assume that everybody should want to sing, you know, hours a day on pitch. Just assume that that's what everyone should do if you love Jesus, because that's what I do. And I think what's happened to us is that pastors, people like me, people who who are called to teach the scriptures, we've kind of given the impression that because we spend a lot of time studying the scriptures, that if you really love Jesus, you should study the scriptures like we do. And I love that instead Paul says, eagerly desire the greater gifts. Don't get hung up on, on the gift that someone else has. And then he says, eagerly desire the greater gifts, and I will show you the most excellent way. And do you know what the most excellent way is, by the way? We're coming up on wedding season, so chances are you'll hear these words soon. Paul, immediately after that, I'll show you the most excellent way. He rolls into 1 Corinthians 13, for I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but I have not love. If I fathom all mysteries and know all knowledge, but I have not love, I am nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Paul makes it so simple. He says, yeah, there are all these different gifts and and the body of Christ is about specialization and differentiation and a balance of gifts. But you know the thing we're universally called to? The greatest gift that we have in the body, it's it's love. I'll tell you, um, I've been thinking about that even since last weekend. Last weekend we had a congregational meeting and some of you were able to come. Thanks for coming. Some of you were not able to come. But what I love about this church here at Pathfinder, it's been true of my entire tenure here over the last 12 plus years, is that even when we have concerns or disagreements, I love that this church lives out our life together under the bond of love. And I certainly saw that last week. So again, thank you for all of, thank you to all of you who came and for coming in a spirit of love. Even while you shared concerns, we wrestled with some different issues. And for those of you who didn't come, I want you to know our church is in a good place. We're going to proceed together under the spirit of truth, under the bond of love. Paul says it's the highest thing. 
See, uh, let, me, let me just be clear. We are not all called to be scholars, but we are all called into a relationship, a personal relationship with the Word of God. And the relationship that I think is most important for all of us, pastors included, is what I talked about earlier. It's that personal or devotional relationship with the Scriptures. And it is a reading of the scriptures for connection even more than meaning. Every day of my life, I I try to read the Bible in this way, usually early in the morning. Uh, And I start off, here's how I start off. I start off by opening the Bible app from YouVersion. I'm always reading through a a book of the Bible, but I always look at the Bible app, uh, uh, the the verse of the day on the Bible app for YouVersion, because sometimes I find that through that simple verse, God speaks to me in a profound and mystical way. This Friday morning, for example, I got up and I looked at the Bible app and I looked at the verse of the day. Friday morning was also my 21st wedding anniversary. And I looked at that verse that was there and I just chuckled because the verse was the key verse out of my wedding ceremony 21 years ago. And I just looked up into the heavens and I'm like, thank you, God. I mean, God knows what he's doing. And he just knew that I needed to hear that verse to be reminded of the fact that he gave me that word 21 years ago. It was an affirmation of 21 years of marriage, of trying to live out the truth of Colossians chapter three. I just had to chuckle, and and that was all I needed that day. And I just fell into a time of prayer with God, God thanking him for the gift of marriage and for the gift of my relationship with Jocelyn and for his faithfulness to me over 21 years. That was all I needed. Uh, Sometimes it's reading through a, a part of the Bible, and I just read until God says something to me, and then I stop. And I fall into a connection with God's spirit. Sometimes it's not even opening a Bible or a Bible app. Sometimes it's a scripture I have memorized. It's like the 23rd Psalm, Psalm 46. David read part of it earlier. It's, uh, it's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. It's just meditating on those scriptures, those, those simple scriptures that are so powerful and true. Sometimes it's even the lyrics of a scripturally based song. Right? I mean... This is how the ancients did it. They didn't have the Bible memorized, but they knew songs that taught them scripture. And and sometimes to me, it's just a word of a scripturally based song that fosters a connection. See, contrast what Paul said to Timothy, that the scriptures are useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training for righteousness. I want you to see what he says to Christians in general, because this defines the other approach to scripture, the approach I want us all to have. He says this in Colossians 3. Speaking to the church now, not to pastors, but to everybody in the church, he says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. See, it's not, hey, study the scriptures for training, correcting, rebuking, right? It's a different word to us. It's a different approach to the scriptures. And here's what he says, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. Let this core message of Christ become yours and, and let it live inside of you and, and let, it, let it dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. So there's teaching and admonishment happening, but look at how with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Notice even when he says, I want you to teach you to admonish one another, he's not like saying, hey, throw the word at each other. He doesn't even mention the full scriptures. He says Psalms. Why? Because those were the songs, the poems that people had memorized. Again, people didn't have Bibles. They weren't literate. They didn't know all of the scriptures, but they knew the Psalms. And guess what? Paul's saying, that's enough. They knew hymns that taught them theology. They knew songs from the spirit that enabled their spirits to connect together as the body around the one same Jesus. See, I love this approach. The focus here for believers is to let the message of Christ dwell in you richly. The clear message of scripture. See, it doesn't matter if you know how many gemstones are gonna be in the gates of heavenly Jerusalem someday. What we're called to do, all of us, as we approach the scriptures, is to come back to that core message again and again that Jesus came down for you He came down in search of you to rescue you. He came 
to break the chains of everything that, that is holding you in captivity, in prison. Jesus came to put to death everything in you and around you that is costing you your life and freedom. He, he came to rescue you, to set you free, to love you. He, he came to adopt you and to call you to be his own. And, and maybe some days you feel like you're nobody and maybe you grew up thinking you were nobody. And yet Jesus came into the world to declare that you are somebody. You're not only somebody, you are God's people. You're sons and daughters of the Most High God. And that because he gave his life for you, he's called you into a relationship with the Father. He has made it so. The core message of scripture is that you were once dead in your transgressions, but because Jesus died and came back to life, you are now alive in Christ, alive in his spirit. See, you don't have to be a scholar to know that stuff. But Paul says, dwell on that message again and again and remind each other of that message and, and tell the world about that message. You don't have to know all of the scriptures. You don't have to be a scholar. Just dwell on that, it is enough. And see, for me, even as a pastor whose, whose job is to do theology, I'm telling you so much of my walk with Christ is simply opening up the word, not even for content, but for connection opening myself up to his voice and his presence and focusing on him because I want to commune with him and I know his word is a way that I get to do that and it does not require high levels of academic understanding. It is something for all of us and it's something we can use to encourage one another. See, this is what transforms people. It's not the scholarly stuff. I, I once knew a guy who went to Vanderbilt School of Divinity and he was taught the New Testament by a secular Jewish man. The guy knew the New Testament through and through, didn't believe a word of it. See, see it's not the knowledge that will give you a, a rooted relationship with Christ. What transforms people, what's most inspiring in, in the Christians that I know who have inspired my faith life are the people who've learned how to dwell in the message of Christ who come back to the scriptures just to be reminded, however that looks, to be reminded again and again of what God has done and, they, and they're so good at reminding everyone else around them. See, here's why this matters. All of this can help determine the question that we have, which translation is best? And here's my hope for you, that you realize that these are all faithful translations and whether you feel you're being called to be a scholar or a teacher in the body of Christ, or whether you're someone who's just called into a personal relationship with the word of God, I hope you can approach the word of God with confidence so that you might dwell in the message of Christ richly, so you might begin and sustain a lifelong relationship with the word of God because it is life-changing. We pray, God in heaven. not only thank you for your word, but thank you for the word that testifies to the true word, to your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I, I pray that you would truly as a body here, let the message of Christ dwell in us richly. Whether we have tons of scriptural knowledge or whether we just know the basics, Lord, I pray for an increase of the knowledge of Christ and what he's done and what he's made us and the difference he's made in this world. And God, enable us to be people, encourage us to be people who share that with each other and, and don't get caught up in, in lofty levels of knowledge, but first and foremost, share the good news of Jesus with each other and with everyone we meet, that we might be changed and that our world might be changed through a relationship with you. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for our service, week three of The Good Book, and thank you for being a part of our online community. We are so glad you joined us today. You can find helpful links to resources in the description below, or you can visit our website, pathfinderstl.org. And while you're at our website, pathfinderstl.org, you can find our message podcasts. These are our messages on the go. You can listen to them from wherever, whenever. So whether you're out with your family, whether you're out for a jog, running errands, this is a great way to never miss out on ways to grow through our messages. And something you can do before you head out is to like, share, or comment on this video. Let us know how we can pray for you or support you through your journey. Let us know how today's service impacted you or simply share it with your friends if you enjoyed today's service. We are so glad you joined us today. Blessings on your week.